I'm not here to dictate how it should be experienced. I'm offering a whole treasure map for people to explore. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on Open Studio, a monumental sculpture rises from the ocean deep. Then Tony-winning actor Harriet Harris on her fourth time playing a first lady. Once the marriage did fall apart and he cheated on her, they stayed in it for his political career. And I think also for what she wanted to accomplish. Plus, artist Micheline Thomas delivers us to 80s night. This is almost like a 3D rendition of a painting with the portraits, with the textures, and with the different spaces. And the band played on. Not getting limited by what we couldn't do, we started thinking about what we could do. And what we could do was a series of chamber music concerts. It's all now on Open Studio. First up, the ruins of a giant palace have emerged in East Boston, thrust up from the ocean floor and hulking just beneath a glittery night sky. It's all the work of artist Firole Baez, who has created this year's installation at the ICA watershed. This is what lies beneath, beneath the rolling waves of Boston Harbor, beneath a city cresting over a storied history. It's the ruins of a palace, and it's artist Firole Baez's vision of what's left if the sea were to recede. This monumental sculpture evokes a very special, very historically loaded space in northern Haiti called Saint Souci. In her largest installation to date, Baez reimagines the ICA's watershed gallery as the site of this archaeological ruin, originally built in 1813 after the revolution in which Haiti gained independence from France. It's a streak of freedom that has pulsed through Boston, too, which is why Baez has evoked the palace here at the museum's East Boston outpost. This site was actually one of the entry points for immigrants from other places in Europe. Just a few steps away is the dock where boats would have unloaded and where people would have been vetted through into the rest of the country. <laughs> Who are the voices I'm hearing right now? So part of this work is really exploring identity formation, especially through revolution. And we have that phrase, the melting pot. But what are the things? What are the condiments? What is the pot that makes up America? And I wanted to capture people who represent all those elements in each doorway. It's really an immersive experience that feeds all of the senses. Color, pattern, sound, all of these elements enrich this experience. Ava Rispini is the ICA's chief curator and commissioned Baez to create the sculpture. I've been following Fairlay's work for some time and she is this incredible painter and uh, really conjures up these beautiful worlds through painting. Baez is of Dominican and Haitian descent but has spent much of her life in the U.S., a background that fuels the layers in her work. In her piece on view at the ICA earlier this year, she took hundreds of discarded pages from history books written about Hispaniola and painted over them with her own history in figures, forms, and embellishments. It's important to remember she is a painter at heart, and everything she does comes from the space of painting, the space of illusion. And so this sculpture here in this architecture is really just the surface for painting and mark making. When we met with Baez this spring, she was leaving her many marks on the installation, which is dotted with symbols of healing, rendered in the indigo printing tradition of West Africa, later adopted in the Caribbean. There is so much that is in the human touch and that in the making, the process reveals the concept behind the work. Does the brick stay exposed? Yeah, so the plan was to get it to see like the under structure was being revealed. Every element in here has been through someone's hand. There's been a loving extended touch that informs everything. And everything here, by the way, is made of household materials, wood, plaster, paint. The blue expanse serving as both a starry night sky and the ocean floor is a series of tarps, which are also a symbol of shelter in the often hurricane-battered Caribbean. Baez hopes visitors might find the whimsy in everyday materials, just as she did as a child. 
I moved around a lot as a child. I went um, to a different school for every year. And that meant that I had space to develop a very rich internal world. I had every new room was a space to create a different environment that brought both comfort and wonder. And that was my doorway into the art world. Does it change now that it's your work? You know, I think the same sense of wonder informs it. It's maybe now I get to share with other people instead of just my family and like my room. <laughs> Which ultimately leaves other people with a choose your own adventure. Here you can dive into the histories Firle Baez interrogates or just marvel at the mysteries of the deep. I'm not here to dictate how it should be experienced. I'm offering a whole treasure map for people to explore. You think I don't recognize that look in your eyes? Are you jealous, Eleanor? I don't care about your romantic escapades. I do care that you are letting your urges change the political direction of this country. Is that what you think? That was Tony-winning actor Harriet Harris as Eleanor Roosevelt in Atlantic Crossing on PBS's Masterpiece earlier this year. It wasn't her first or even last time playing the First Lady. She'll do it again this summer in the play Eleanor at Barrington Stage Company. Harriet Harris, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for, for inviting me. This is your fourth time playing Eleanor Roosevelt. That's a very, I'm not sure I've ever seen this before, that's a very specific type of typecasting. Yes, it's not what you dream of, but it is a dream role. But it's not what you really want to have people say, oh, she's, she's like Eleanor. Except, of course, you do want to be like Eleanor Roosevelt. In ways that would matter, I wish I were. But it's really just my big teeth. <laughs> well, tell us, what has drawn you to playing her originally? I've always thought, wow, she's, she's the most amazing American woman, but she's, she's just an amazing American woman. And, and uh, she's just a, a, a joy to learn more and more about. Even the things that are deeply complicated about her are, are um, fascinating. We see some of that conflict. We see some of what made her extraordinary in this piece. At what point do we meet her and, wh and what ground do you cover in this show? We meet her actually after she's died and she's a, a energetic spirit um, roaming the earth, still trying to find a, a place for herself and where she really ultimately fit in and belongs and where she can rest. Well, then who was I besides a first lady? I view those years almost impersonally. It was like I had erected someone outside of myself because I didn't know who I was inside. And I was afraid to find out. It sounds kind of spooky and um, strange, but it, that, that part of the story is sort of dispensed with right up front. But it's, it's, you know, you have to meet the audience some way and everybody knows that Eleanor's gone. So she confronts it in a rather humorous way, I think, and says, and now let's move on so, so I can move forward and do what I need to do. And being Eleanor Roosevelt, she always wants to accomplish her goals. I said everything Franklin could never say. I spoke about our need for birth control programs and, and pregnancy education. I, I said that we had to stop pitting race against race. So I understand for, for you, part of what has so attracted you to this role and to her as a person is the marriage, which I think history has, has often tried to reconcile how that marriage existed and what it meant for her. I, like anybody who would be playing Eleanor, would be making assumptions. But uh, having read about her and think, feeling like she was a young lost girl with no parents and was sent away to school and was brought home and fell madly in love. And when you see pictures of Eleanor and Franklin, when they are young and in love, they almost look like they're eating a bowl of ice cream or something. They really look like, I just can't, I can't get enough of you. And they look so energized together. And that maybe that doesn't make always make a perfect marriage. And once 
the marriage did fall apart and he cheated on her and she couldn't reconcile that, um, they stayed in it for his political career. And I think also for what she wanted to accomplish. And they stayed deeply connected, even though uh, a lot of the marriage was over very early on. Well, in terms of what she accomplished, it must be re very rewarding, but also slightly disappointing to look at the civil rights work that she did. And I say disappointing because so much of what she did is happening all these year, all these decades later. I think Eleanor really did believe in an evolution in a, uh, of society and, um, and an acceptance of people. It was still a um, elite white woman's business to be the person that was extending themselves and saying, I need to make room for you. At that point, uh, many people in America really did believe there was this um, permission that had to be granted and, uh, and that Eleanor was in a position to do it. And she was. I'm always curious as an actor, when you're playing a real life figure, do you do you focus more on the biography, the, the real life figure, or is she a character in this case for you? The way Mark has written her, he has crafted something that really fits together and I think brings, it's not just like Eleanor Roosevelt's greatest hits or something like that, but it's, it's feelings that she has from different parts of her life and accomplishments and things that you think, oh my gosh, this fits together almost, you know, so beautifully. It, it, uh, that you barely need to use your imagination. It almost seems like she's the ballast at this point when you consider a lot of the other roles that you often play that are, are really, really big or really, really bad, in your case, the roles that go your way. I can tell it's good for uh, my, my soul when I get to, uh, get to play her because you get to, you get to live in a, a very unselfish part of your brain and, and you have to. Um, so it, it uh, I love that. And I, I do love playing wicked people and bad people and extremely selfish people, because that is what's funny about people. As theater is reopening, you're among the first people to be back on the stage. What does that represent for you? <sighs> it was such a hard year. It was so, uh, it, it was very, very hard. I mean, on everybody, you know, on everybody in so many ways to have been denied the opportunity to work um, is is harrowing. When they said they were shutting down Broadway for two weeks, I just thought that's just to get the actors out of the building because <laughs> otherwise we're not going to leave the building, you know. <laughs> but to get to go back to work uh, and to get to do what, what you've, either what you've just gotten out of school and you want to do for what you have been working on for so long to get to do it's great. Well, Harriet Harris, thank you for being one of the people to bring us back to the theater. Make us find oh, that joy again. You. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Want to know what's on tap at Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival or which veteran actor is taking on one of the most vaunted roles in theater? Find out in Arts This Week. Sunday marks the 48th anniversary of Live and Let Die. It was the first Bond movie featuring Roger Moore as 007. Original Bond Sean Connery had begged off, but signed on to Moore as his replacement. The Dorrance Dance Company taps its way onto the outdoor stage at Jacob's Pillow Wednesday. Its tap dance takeover was composed during the COVID pandemic and addresses loneliness and chaos. Visit the Museum of Russian Icons Thursday for Atomic Alert, confronting the bomb in the new atomic age. It considers how America was chilled by the Cold War. Friday marks the return of in-person performances at Shakespeare and Company in Lenox. King Lear is on the bill, and it stars actor Christopher Lloyd as the patriarch presiding over an epic family feud. Head to the ICA Saturday to see Figures of Speech, an exhibition highlighting the work of artist, fashion designer, and musician Virgil Abloh. When not at the ICA, he's the menswear artistic director at Louis Vuitton. 
Next, grab your platform shoes and give the disco ball a twirl, because we head to the Bass Museum of Art in Florida, where artist Micheline Thomas recently created the installation Better Nights, an interactive, three-dimensional work of art. Are you in the 80s? Are you in the 70s? Or is this fantasy? Or is it both? Micheline Thomas was inspired by one single Polaroid that she found that belonged to her mother. And the Polaroid referenced parties that she would have in the late 70s and beginnings of the 80s. It was almost like a time stamp. She was looking at the 70s, 80s style, but also looking at a very specific history that belonged to the artist. Better Nights very directly refers to her mother and memories of her mother in a very personal way. Her mother was doing the parties to raise money for sickle cell anemia. It's this metaphor of a community coming together for a good cause. And I think that is really, the, the exhibition is an homage to her mother and how that happened. And now Micheline is bringing together the community for a good cause as well. I'm Sylvia Carmen Cubina. I'm executive director and chief curator of the Bass. I like to say that Better Nights really is like walking into one of Micheline Thomas's paintings. So the Bass is recently looking for immersive experiences and artists that are willing to work with the public and bring them into their works of art and sort of make it whole that way. Micheline Thomas, when she presented this to me, she said it's a social space. It's a space that not only other artists show in, it's a space where I want the public to come in and interact and share moments and sort of activate the space. Better Nights kind of opens up to us with this collage, which is called Jet Blue Number 13. But it picks up sort of her very characteristic um, way of creating collages and also paintings, but even Better Nights. As you can see, the wallpaper seems to sort of pick itself off the wall and continue on to the work of art. But also you can see sort of wooden areas that I see sort of in there and it also picks up the floor. So it's all these patterns and you can see uh, Micheline Thomas's very characteristic women of color, so black women in her work, and posing sort of like, I am beautiful and I am bold and here I am and all those wonderful qualities. Then you walk into the gallery where she's invited all her friends. Most of these works, and we realized it as we were installing, are figurative works. So a lot of them are portraits or self-portraits of people, and many of them people of color. That's something that is very, very present in her work. So this is almost like a 3D rendition of a painting with the portraits, with the textures, and with the, the different spaces. The video selection room is also many different works of art. The bar area with uh, six different Micheline Thomas works of art. It functions as a whole, but it also functions in different little parts. It's very multidisciplinary. Not only did she invite artists to participate, she also invited musicians and performers to be part of this whole adventure. Interactive art, it is wonderful once it's being done, but it presents lots of challenges for museums. We are museum professionals, and we're trained to receive objects and take care of them and almost put them on a shelf or on a pedestal, literally. And um, bringing in an interactive art, you have to accept the public, which you don't know if they're going to sit on a furniture, stand on a furniture. You really don't know what is going to happen. And that is a little bit of the beauty and the challenge of it. So all throughout planning this project, we kept saying, okay, this is an art exhibition. We have to do condition reports on the works of art and put them on the wall. Oh, but wait, this is also a bar. So people are going to be dancing on this dance floor and it's gonna get scratched up. But we want it to get scratched up. So it's a little bit of a tug of war and it really puts museums at a tension point, good tension point, where you're, you're always examining, okay, why do we exist? Do we exist for the objects? Yes, but we also exist for the guests. And how do we balance that out? The beauty of interactive work is that you get a different work of art 
every time you open your door. Finally now confronted with the pandemic, the classical Tahoe Music Festival found a way to carry on with live performances, safely and intimately. Classical Tahoe started in 2012 as a vision of building community at Lake Tahoe. Some of the finest musicians in the world have made Lake Tahoe their summer home. Under the auspices of Classical Tahoe, where a three-week classical music festival it takes place on the campus of Sierra Nevada University. And it's in a pop-up pavilion, it seats about 400 people, full orchestra of about 60, and audience of about 400 in these incredible acoustics in the forest. And we do about a dozen concerts over three weeks. Every night is different. Joel Revson who was our founding artistic director and conductor, he, through a group of people, assembled this incredible orchestra and put together the orchestra concerts. So it's intense, it's fabulous, and it's a really great opportunity to have music at the highest level, community building in a way that people at the end of three weeks have made lifetime friends and feel embedded in the community. While well, the pandemic's unfolding in March and April, and Joel got sick at the very beginning, maybe the third week in March, came down with COVID, and fought it for the better part of 60 days, maybe 70, in and out of the hospital. But even as he was getting sicker, and we knew we couldn't have the orchestra festival, I think the piece that became more and more important was that Joel loved this orchestra more than, I think, more than anything besides his wife Cindy in the world. It seemed more important than ever in honor of Joel, both before he died, but then more important after he passed, was to gather this group together to make music because that's what he would have wanted more than anything. And that's what all of us wanted. Organizations are canceling spring, summer, we weren't going to be able to gather. It didn't make sense to build a pop-up pavilion that held 400 people. How do you space an orchestra on a stage if they all have to be six feet apart? What do you do with an audience that can sit with their husband or wife or partner or family, but not near anybody else? Not getting limited by what we couldn't do, we started thinking about what we could do. And what we could do was a series of chamber music concerts. We started imagining places in the forest and on the lake where you could gather and create a concert setting in a venue. So we had to break down what's normally about 60 people to groups of 10 coming each week. That's how we began to build probably version C plus of what was possible. We put together three weeks of 10 musicians and we had to address a number of things. We wanted everyone to get COVID tests before they came. We had a medical advisor that worked with us. We were studying the best practices about how far the winds and the vocalists should be. We had wind tapes, so we knew which way we were singing and sitting. We had positioned our French horn so that the horn was away from anybody to the back. So we actually had done a ton of research and consultations to find out the safest ways to make music possible. The arts are transformative in that they have held people up in the hardest times. And they're always what give you a reason to get back together when the hardest times have passed. I think had we stepped back and waited I don't know that that joy of what Joel created for this festival could be kindled in the same way that it absolutely became a beacon this summer and something that will never be lost. Everybody has been asking, please, let's do chamber music in the forest again. I think the one thing that comes out of something as complicated as a year of a pandemic and 
losing your founding artistic director is you can treat it as a tragedy and roll it up, or you can look at it as an opportunity to say, what could we be? And that is all for this edition of Open Studio. Next week, it's a turn-of-the-century tour as we look back at the artists who defined the early 20th century, like John Singer Sargent and his longtime African-American model. The man in these drawings was clearly black, and I thought, what's going on here? Who is this man? Has anyone figured out who he is? Then James McNeil Whistler and his mother. Because of her very conservative religious appearance, she was able to act as an anchor for him in this very sort of eccentric way that he led his life. Until then, I'm Jared Bowen. Thanks for joining us. As always, you can visit us online at gbh.org slash openstudio. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at OpenStudioGBH.